I believe you're all free to turn on or off your own video. Uh, we're recording, so that's important. Our speaker will be presenting slides and materials for about an hour, and after that, we'll have a brief question and answer period. If you'd like to ask a question, wave or type your name into the chat bar, and I will call on you, and you'll be able to unmute yourself. I'll repeat that part when the talk is over. Um, finally, this talk is being recorded, so we can offer it to others on our website. So look for this uh, recording on our YouTube channel later. Um, go ahead and recommend it to your friends. Does anybody have any questions before we begin? Hearing none, I'd like to introduce our wonderful speaker, Rosa Yu. I met Rosa earlier this summer and I basically begged her to come and talk. Uh, so I'm personally very excited about this presentation. She is the Hor uh, forest health specialist in the New Jersey Forest Service. She's worked for the Forest Service since 2004, working for the Urban and Community Forestry Program for several years before transferring to the Forest Health Program in 2011. Although she primarily works with invasive pests and diseases that threaten our native forest, she also works on restoring tree species that are at risk of extirpation as a result of invasive pests and diseases. Rosa is a graduate of SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry and holds a bachelor's and master's degree in forest resource management. Take it away, Rosa. Thank you so much, Lori, and thank you for everybody who's attending today. Um, hopefully you guys can all hear me okay. Um, all right, so I just wanted to give a little brief background of what forest health kind of means and I guess the definition um, I don't think there is an exact definition but I guess how it applies to what I do in work is you know I'm basically looking at things that will affect our forests on a landscape scale so looking at large impacts um, this top picture is southern pine beetle back in about 2012 in New Jersey and so you can see southern pine beetle um, is a forest health threat because of its potential to to be to spread in these large areas um, another another example is emerald ash borer which is the map below uh, just showing its potential to spread you know across the country and so that becomes a forest health issue so really forest health can mean a lot of things to different people or what their role is in the forest health world um, but basically what i'm looking at is how we can sustain or maintain populations that provide both an ecological and social benefit so you know my job is kind of to be aware and knowledgeable of these forest health threats and do what I can to either detect it early, um, prevent it from entering, you know, our state, or if it's already here, then if there's any kind of management activities we can do to kind of prevent it from creating these large scale uh, mortality events. Forest health by no means me by no means equals no mortality because in a forested setting, uh, tree mortality is really critical in the whole cycle of life. And so trees have to die essentially so that other trees can come in or other trees can grow. So there is a, such a thing as healthy tree mortality. And really what I look for is when it becomes imbalanced where mortality is really exceeding the growth or the replacement. So those are the things that I'm kind of mainly concerned about. Um, so sorry, that was kind of long, but, uh, but I do, I work with a lot of different insects and pathogens and even like abiotic factors um, that affect our uh, health of our forest. And this is just a list of some things that, um, that we actually have in the state. And I'll go over a couple things that we don't yet have in the state, but we're monitoring for so that uh, we can detect it as early as possible and kind of prevent it or slow it from, you know, slow it down before it spreads, uh, spreads quickly. Um, so I tried to keep the things that we already have in the state uh, in the beginning and then the things that we don't really have yet will be near the end. And this is by no means like a uh, an exclusive list. There are many other things that we look for and um, 
that we kind of work with. I just, you know, I, I try to pick kind of the most uh, recent or important ones. So the first insect I'm gonna talk about is spotted lanternfly. I'm sure uh, many people are familiar with this insect. Um, it is a non-native insect that was introduced in Pennsylvania. I believe it was 2012, possibly, if I get, can remember correctly. Um, and it kind of stayed in that uh, central east part of Pennsylvania, like the Berks County area for a couple of years um, before it was detected in New Jersey in 2018. Um, since that time, spotted lanternfly is found in 19 of our 21 counties, um, and that's established population. So you can see on the map here, I believe it's Ocean and Cape May County are not colored in, but just know that spotted lanternflies, individual spotted lanternflies have been found there, just not uh, like populations that they consider um, established, like found on wild trees down the wild. So it might be uh, one that was found in a house or a dead one that was found. Uh, but essentially it's, it is spreading pretty rapidly. And you can see where it's also spreading across in the Northeast. So being found in new states and new counties all the time. I don't wanna go too much into like the identification of spotted lanternfly because I feel like it is a pretty well-known insect, but there are some pictures here that show what they look like. Um, they basically start off as a little black insect with white spots. And then as they mature, they change into like being red in color and then into the adult, which is the winged um, insect you see at the top. Their egg masses are really cryptic because they basically look like mud or clay. And so uh, it's really easy to transport spotted lantern fly unintentionally, uh, not only the movement of wood, but with any uh, material really. So they will lay their eggs on um, metal, on furniture, on vehicles, on, <laughs> on signs. Um, so anytime, you know, people move these things, they just have to be aware uh, if they're in a spotted lanternfly infested area that uh, they check those things to make sure they're not spreading it further. Um, Penn State actually put out a really nice um, kind of quick facts about spotted lanternfly. And so I basically copied this off of their website. I really look to Penn State Extension a lot because they are, they are really um, kind of the clearinghouse for spotted lanternfly information. So if anybody wants to find out more information on it, uh, Penn State Extension has a lot of really great resources. But basically it's that spotted lanternfly, it is a destructive invasive pest, mainly a threat to agriculture and ornamental plants. Um, there hasn't really been a link to spotted lanternfly and its effect on trees and forests at this time, although they do know that they feed on trees. Um, but because they have such a wide host range, uh, they move from tree to tree. And so the amount of feeding they do on an individual tree, it, at this time, it doesn't seem like it's enough to cause a tree to actually die uh, from spotted lanternfly infestation. Now, if you talk about plants or agricultural crops that are smaller and might not have as, as a robust uh, reserve or that the spotted lanternfly really likes to feed on, so they'll kind of stay on that plant, um, like grapes, for example, um, they can kill those plants that that has been observed. So, um, so that's kind of important, I guess, to think about. Um, in New Jersey, the spotted lanternfly program is run by the State Department of Agriculture and the USDA APHIS. And basically, my role is just to assist them in any way I can when it comes to uh, spotted lanternfly management or treatments on state lands, so state-owned parks or forests or fish and wild properties. But other than that, um, it's really run by those two agencies. Um, but sorry, I'm moving off of this slide. Uh, but basically it means that spotted lanternfly, it's really more of a nuisance, I guess. Uh, they don't bite or sting, um, but they, they do have this behavior of aggregation. So uh, if any of you guys had uh, spotted lanternfly populations in your yard or you went somewhere where you saw them, you, you would tell that uh, they like to be around each other. And so it does make them a little more creepy than some other insects uh, that, might, that you might see around. But really, um, 
really it's a it's kind of more of a nuisance pest that that's a threat to um, agriculture is kind of the primary issue. But of course, we don't want to continue to spread it um, or or encourage them. Um, so I just included a couple pictures here of some of the impact. Or like the first picture is the impact on understory vegetation, which which is a potential impact in our forests. So basically the spotted lanternfly exude a honeydew material, which is a sugary substance. And that substance supports black sooty mold. And when the black sooty mold um, grows on the leaves of anything that's underneath the uh, infested tree, it blocks that plant's ability to photosynthesize. So any kind of regeneration or vegetation, um, they can decline or even die uh, when there's enough sooty mold covering their leaf surface. So some things that people can do and have been doing is setting up these traps to try to reduce populations. And so, you know, there's these sticky bands, um, but of course put like a mesh covering or something so that uh, you're not, um, you know, trapping non-target uh, animals or insects on it because a spotted lanternfly does have another behavior where it likes to climb up trees and then they kind of fall out of the trees up back onto the ground and then they'll climb up again. So they have this behavior where they like to climb up the tree. So if you put a sticky band around the tree, it will catch them. Um, the sticky band is probably most effective on the immature stages, like when they're black or red. Once they become adults, I think they, they get a little stronger and they may not stick, they might be able to get themselves off a little easier, um, but you can use that for anything. And then the other one is a circle trap, which um, Lori and I have talked about, like how to make a good circle trap. So like I've, I've made them with my kids. I think Lori said she made a few. Um, Penn State Extension does have a video and kind of like a tutorial on how to make them. You make them out of like household items. And that actually is good for trapping um, any life stage of spotted lanternfly. So uh, it's just a way to try to reduce um, the populations. Of course, scraping egg masses is also a good, a good thing. Um, there are some, uh, there are some information on applications for spotted lanternfly control, but um, I didn't include anything in here. I think, you know, anytime herbicides or insecticides are used, you know, um, obviously follow the label or if you're not sure, hire a licensed pesticide applicator because uh, those are chemicals that are toxic and you surely don't want to be applying them in an inappropriate way. Um, so I just included a couple websites that have more information if you want to look. Like I said, Penn State Extension is a really great resource. And then in New Jersey, the Department of Agriculture does have a spotted lanternfly website um, that also has kind of New Jersey specific information on it. All right, the next, the next big issue which, which actually brought uh, me and Lori together was emerald ash borer. So um, this was detected in New Jersey in 2014, um, kind of in the Somerset County area. Um, so its main hosts are ash trees, any species of ash. So there's four in the state, uh, green ash, white ash, black ash, and pumpkin ash, and they're all susceptible to emerald ash borer. White fringe tree was recently uh, acknowledged as a suitable host for emerald ash borer. White fringe tree is, there's two types, I guess. One is a native fringe tree, and then there is a Chinese fringe tree, which is more of an ornamental. So the Chinese fringe tree is actually resistant to emerald ash borer, but the, our native fringe tree, which, um, which does have its natural range kind of in the southern part of the state, um, is susceptible to emerald ash borer. So just be aware um, about that. Um, so, so far EAB has been detected in 17 counties. Um, to be honest, uh, we have not really been keeping up with the, the detections in EAB, but if somebody were to call and say, you know, I live in Atlanta County and I think I have EAB, you know, we would go and confirm it. But we, we're really no longer um, trapping or monitoring because um, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty much spread across the majority of the state and in places where, within the uh, natural range of ash. So I think my next slide might have the range. Yeah. So this map shows the distribution of ash. So you can see the majority of it is in that northern half of the state. Um, that doesn't mean that 
there's not ash trees in the southern part of the state, uh, especially like street trees, you know, where it's commonly planted or landscape trees or in parks. You know, it is, it's present, present there. But our main concern was really um, in these forested areas. And, um, and so once EAB was kind of found in those areas, uh, you know, we kind of shifted our priority to kind of management and conservation of those trees. So just so you know, New Jersey has over 24 million ash trees in forested areas, um, an estimated 24 million, and EAB will kill nearly 100% of them. So uh, it is, it's a very challenging insect, um, very aggressive, and, uh, and so we've been trying to do what we can. So there are some things you can do to manage for emerald ash borer. Um, there are chemical treatments that are available. So the picture um, down here is showing um, ash trees being treated. It's, we, it's called an IV system. So basically you drill a hole at the base of the tree. These tubes have kind of, I'll call it a needle, even though it's not sharp, but it's a needle you insert it in the hole. It's a pressurized system. So the pesticide goes straight from the bottle that's holding it uh, directly into the tree. Um, so you can treat healthy ash trees. The pesticide is taken up by the tree. So you wanna make sure that the tree is mostly healthy before you treat. Um, otherwise it might not be able to disperse throughout the crown. Um, uh, and and if and certain treatments are effective for one year and some are effective for like three years. So it all depends on what the treatment options, but just know that that is an option if you have a special ash tree or uh, ecologically important um, ash trees and their treatments available to protect them. Um, in New Jersey, I, I treat uh, the ash trees in like high use areas, like in parks, um, or eat, like we do have a couple of black ash and pumpkin ash stands, which are kind of our more rare ash species that we also treat. And so, you know, we've kind of been treating these trees since I'm going to say 2015, we probably started. And I use the method where we treat every three years. So um, I'm going on my third, if it makes sense, mathematically, my third cycle on some trees. Um, the other thing that you probably want to look at is removing infested trees or ash trees that are not slated for treatment that are in like high use areas. Um, because when ash trees die or become infested, their wood is really brittle. And especially if it's like, uh, you know, at a trailhead or near a building or something like that, and you, you're not treating it, um, you know, kind of scheduling the removal on a more spread out basis, I guess, might be better than waiting until the trees all become infested and then you have to remove a whole bunch of them at one time. So this kind of like um, staggered tree room um, is another method uh, just, just to minimize that hazardous tree situation. So you can see here uh, they're removing an ash tree. Um, the other thing that we're doing and I cooperate with the State Department of Agriculture are biological control releases. So these are parasitoid wasps and even though they're called wasps, they do not sting humans or animals. Um, this down here is one of the wasps that we, re we release. They're about the size of a gnat. Um, this here is an emerald ash borer egg. So that's how much it's zoomed in. So the parasitoid wasps, they either lay their eggs in an emerald ash borer egg or an emerald ash borer larva. And then when the parasitoid wasps larva start to mature, they feed on that egg or larva and essentially you know, kill the emerald ash borer. So, um, so here's just some examples of what the biocontrol releases look like. This is um, a bolt that has EAB larvae in it that have parasitoid wasp larvae in the EAB larvae. <laughs> this orange container has the egg parasitoid. So it's basically on a piece of like coffee filter paper uh, with EAB eggs that are parasitized. And then this cup is, um, that's the only form where we receive adults and those are another larval parasitoid. So that when you basically just open the cup and the parasitoids fly out. Um, I can't emphasize enough that if ash trees are lost or removed um, to just try to replant with a non-host species in a diverse way so that uh, you can try to kind of recoup um, the loss of those trees. 
Um, beech leaf disease is kind of our newest uh, forest health threat that was found in New Jersey this past summer. So in 2020, it was found in New Jersey, but it actually started in Ohio in 2012. And uh, it was Cleveland Metro Parks. They started seeing this weird leaf damage on beech trees and, and they didn't know what it was and they didn't know if it was gonna kill their beech. Um, but eventually they, just in 2019, they linked it to a nematode called Lily Lankus. Um, so basically, uh, here's the nematode. Nematodes are basically like a very simple organism. Um, you can really only see them microscopically. So it's not like you could look at a leaf and see a nematode. Um, so it does have to be observed on, in a microscope. Um, Beech leaf disease affects beech trees of any age and any size, but it's most susceptible to beech trees that are younger or smaller. So really the seedlings or understory um, trees are most susceptible, whereas the more mature um, dominant trees uh, in the canopy, uh, so far there haven't been reports of any of them uh, actually dying from beech leaf disease, uh, but I guess it's still kind of a little too early to well, it just hasn't been observed yet, I guess is my point. But they had, have observed seedlings and smaller size beech trees dying. They gave a window of like two to seven years. Um, it is somewhat of a progressive disease in that it will kind of start with maybe a couple of leaves with uh, some minor banding, and then it will eventually year after year kind of get worse and worse. The, the me method of spread of beech leaf disease is still not known because um, it's linked to this nematode. They're not sure how the nematode is moving from tree to tree. So on this map, um, beech leaf disease was first identified in this light, light uh, yellow greenish color. And you can see how it has jumped, you know, to like Massachusetts and Connecticut and, you know, New York and New Jersey. So like how that actually moved is not really sure. Um, or even like the progression from where it was first found moving out, you know, into this Western Pennsylvania area. So they are trying to, you know, researchers are trying to figure that out. So here's just some pictures of beech leaf disease infected trees from New Jersey. It has that characteristic uh, banding, which occurs either between the veins of the leaf or along the vein of the leaf. And it's most easily seen if, you're, if you hold a leaf up and you look towards the sky or you look towards a light. So it is a little difficult to see if you're looking down, like here you can see we're looking down on it and the bands look a little chlorotic, more chlorotic. But when you hold it up to the light, it has a darker, um, darker look and it is a little easier to see. Um, but the leaf banding is really one of the main symptoms of beech leaf disease. And then um, as it progresses, what happens is the leaves will start to curl. They will uh, become thick, like leathery feeling. Um, and then eventually they will, the leaves themselves will become necrotic. They'll, they'll have these brown or black spots and then the entire leaf will eventually uh, fall off. Um, the nematode is, is believed to kind of live in the bud of the tree and so what also happens is that the buds will form but then the nematode will affect the buds to where uh, the bud also dies so then no leaves come out of that bud um, so so that's another way that it kind of defoliates the plant or the tree um, over time there's no current treatment known um, but Basically, if anybody sees signs of beech leaf disease, um, just report it. You can report it to me or you can report it uh, to, you know, now there's like these apps out there that you can report them to. I don't know all the names of them, but, um, but you know, just so we can get keep kind of track of it. The two sites that were confirmed in New Jersey were in Bergen and Essex County, kind of closest to the New York finds, um, but it really could be, could be anywhere. Um, I just haven't been able to monitor, but this summer I am going to do a little more uh, uh, consistent monitoring across the state to see if I can find it in any other places. I included this <laughs> slide on oak shot hole leaf miner. It, this is a native fly that causes this, uh, I call it Swiss cheese, um, feeding on oak leaves. It hasn't caused an issue in oak trees that I can tell 
and uh, other states are also reporting like you know they're seeing more damage from oak shot hole leaf mine or two um where the entire tree will have like these swiss cheese holes uh but the trees that i've seen uh, seem still appear to be fairly healthy and uh, i guess it's just going to be a matter of time to see if the flies continue to you know cause this damage year after year if the trees eventually do start to kind of get stressed because of this feeding damage but basically what happens is the feet it's a it's a little fly and uh right when the leaves are about to emerge from the bud she inserts her ovipositor into the leaf and sops up the leaf juices and that's how she eats um, cause they don't, flies don't have like teeth to bite into the leaves. And so when she creates these little holes, as the leaf grows and emerges from the bud, those holes also grow and emerge. Um, so, uh, I've never noticed this, um, up until it was probably a year or two ago, I noticed a leaf, um, up in, I don't know, it might've been like Passaic County or something. Um, and I thought, Hey, this is really odd. You know, this is a weird leaf. And I took it, I saved it. And then, um, I went to a forest health meeting and they were like, hey, look out for this oak shot hole leaf miner. And I was like, oh, that's what it was. So it, it, it's not really widespread. It's just something if you see it um, and you notice it, I don't know, just, I guess, see if it's, if it's affecting your tree or not. Um, but I just thought I'd include it because it is, I am kind of seeing it a little more. Um, gypsy moth, on the other hand, <laughs> is, an, is not a native insect that's been in New Jersey, you know, first detected in New Jersey in 1920. So this is probably one of the oldest forest health issues that, uh, that New Jersey has been dealing with. And to be honest, I think before gypsy moth or, you know, the person who, who ran the forest health program before me, gypsy moth was all he did like that. He only did one thing and it was gypsy moth. Um, you know, I don't have that luxury today to kind of focus on just one thing, but gypsy moth was the big thing. So gypsy moth, you know, was ac was actually intentionally introduced into Massachusetts for like silk war silk production, um, but it escaped, and uh, and that's how it started to slowly spread. So uh, so it was actually um, introduced on purpose, um, but you know, for anybody who, who has seen gypsy moth caterpillars, which are the, the life stage that causes the most damage, they're kind of unique because they have these blue dots on the back and then these red dots closer to its head. So uh, there's not really another caterpillar that has those uh, spots, the red and blue spots, except for uh, Asian gypsy moth. So this is the European gypsy moth and there's also an Asian gypsy moth, which we don't have in New Jersey, but they do look pretty similar. But basically the female, um, here's the female moth. She cannot fly, she's too large. And so uh, when the gypsy moth are active, the adults are active, it'll just be the male that you see flying around and the female will just walk up and down the tree. Um, this here, this picture here is of the egg mass. So, uh, that's what actually I monitor for our egg masses. And then we do kind of like a prediction model for populations the next season. And you can see here, this is probably an old pupa case. So probably, you know, uh, an adult emerged from there and then maybe laid her eggs. Um, there were a lot of biological controls released, not a lot, but there were several biological controls released back in the, I don't even remember, maybe like in the seventies or eighties. And they, they established and they do a pretty good job of keeping gypsy moth populations under control, um, but they're not perfect. So in 1981 was actually the worst gypsy moth defoliation event in New Jersey when over 800,000 acres were impacted. And, uh, and it really killed a lot, of, a lot of trees. And so, you know, my goal with gypsy moth is to kind of prevent it from ever even getting close to that, that number of acres of uh, defoliation. So again, this is another program I work really closely with the State Department of Agriculture. They conduct every year uh, an aerial survey to detect defoliation that happens around June. And so they just map everywhere that they see defoliation. And then I get that map. And then uh, sometime in the fall, I'll go out at the spots and I'll see if there's any egg masses. And then that's how we determine if there's gonna be a, an issue or not. Um, you can see like uh, in 2020, this is the defoliation <laughs> map and it might not look like there's anything, but there's these little black spots and those are 
those are what were mapped as defoliation. So it wasn't, um, I should also note that I only survey on state owned land. So the Department of Agriculture does municipal lands and then I do state, state owned land. So if these dots don't fall on state owned lands, I don't really survey unless there's something close by. Um, so I just wanted to go over a little bit the biological controls that are kind of like the main ones, the main, uh, the most effective, I guess, uh, that help to control gypsy moth populations. So the one is a fungus, it's called Entomophaga mammega. And uh, basically this really thrives when there's wet springs. So when it's dry, um, Entomophaga mammega just isn't present or isn't as effective. And so, uh, so we always hope for wet springs so that the fungus is there to kind of keep the gypsy moth caterpillars um, in check. The other biocontrol is called and I can never pronounce this, nucleopolyhedrous virus. We call it NPV for short. And this one is kind of like, maybe I could say now it's kind of like COVID. Um, so it really only spreads when there's a lot of caterpillars in one place to give it to each other. Um, so it's a virus that they spread to each other. And obviously at low populations, when they're spread far apart, like social distancing, they are not affected by NPV. But when the populations get high and they're close together, then they can spread it to each other much more quickly and NPV is much more effective. So, uh, so it's kind of ironic, but you have to hope for like a high population and then NPV will be effective. So uh, then there's, there are other biological controls. Like I think there's a fly that uh, parasitizes its eggs, but um. Uh, you know, and then uh, certain animals also feed on gypsy moth. So those all come into play. But basically, uh, when the biocontrols are not effective at keeping their populations low, and we have a lot of defoliation observed in like June, um, and then, you know, our egg mass surveys result in a lot of big healthy egg masses, um, then we will implement a suppression program. And that's basically um, aerial applications of a product called BTK. It's basically a bacteria that uh, occurs naturally in the soil and it's formulated specifically for, um, I don't know if it's specifically for gypsy moth, but there's BT for like mosquitoes and there's BT for other insects. So this one is specific for uh, gypsy moth or uh, I guess yeah, I guess gypsy moth. And we and you have to apply it when the gypsy moth are in their first or second instars because once they get too big and they consume the BTK, um, it doesn't kill them anymore. And even at the um, when it's applied in May in their first or second instars, I forget the exact percentage, but um, it's not like it's it's so effective it kills all of them. It might be like a 60% reduction or something like that. So that's the point is we just want to bring that population down so that we don't have this widespread uh, mortality event. Oh, so I forgot I added this in here. So um, there are actually two really common lookalikes or that people call me about and say like, I have gypsy moth, you know, come help me. And they say they have these webs in their trees. So gypsy moth don't actually create any kind of webbing or nest. Um, these are different kind of caterpillars, which are actually native. So the fall webworm is actually a late season defoliator, um, I guess, hence its name. So although it, it, it does uh, become active kind of in the late summer. Um, and these, they build their this web kind of on the ends of the branches. So if you see that, uh, it's fall webworm, it's a native insect, not really a concern to us, um, first of all, because it's a late season defoliator, but also because it's a native insect and it hasn't really uh, caused an issue uh, from a forest health perspective. If it's like your yard tree and you don't like how it looks, um, then there are treatments that you can do to kind of control that. The Eastern tent caterpillar is another, um, caterpillar, another native caterpillar. This one builds its web in the crotch of the branches. So not on the end of the branches, but where the branches kind of meet, um, they'll, they'll grow, they'll uh, build their nest there. Again, another native, uh, not really of concern. Um, but again, if it's in your yard and uh, unsightly, there are things that you can do to kind of, um, you know, control them. But from a forest health perspective, we're not concerned about these two. And, um, and I just want to put it out there that gypsy moth don't create uh, 
nests or webs. <laughs> um, so uh, bacteria leaf scorch is a is actually a native bacteria that um, kind of moved up north from kind of the southern states. It was first detected in the southern part of New Jersey in Morristown, where they noticed uh, their oak trees. You know, were having were having these scorched scor their leaves were scorching, and they weren't sure why. So they eventually discovered that it was bacterial leaf scorch. Bacterial leaf scorch affects mainly oak trees in the red oak family um, and not necessarily white oaks. And it's because bacterial leaf scorch is a bacteria that uh, clogs the water transporting vessels. So if anybody is familiar with like wine barrels, um, wine barrels are usually made from white oak because white oak, the vessels are plugged with something called tyloses. Red oak, on the other hand, their vessels are open. And so if you put wine in a red oak barrel, your wine would leak out. So the bacteria, what it's doing is it's clogging those vessels um, in the red oak family tree. So that would be like red oak, pin oak, um, black oak, scarlet oak. Those are all in the red oak family. They all have open vessels in their wood. Um, it also affects some other trees that I've heard in other states, but I've, I've never seen it in New Jersey, but um, people do say it affects elms and sweet gum and maple and some other trees too. So it is something to look out for. But basically it, it clogs those vessels and it's kind of this slow death because the tree, it kind of blocks vessels a little bit at a time. So it might start with like one branch having these uh, scorched leaves and then the next year um, it might have like another branch and it will slowly progress. Um, but oak trees really can hang on quite a long time that have bacterial leaf scorch. Um, I would say like 10 or more years is not unreasonable for a tree that has bacterial leaf scorch. Um, uh, one of the key identifying factors uh, features, which doesn't always happen, is this halo appearance between the, the brown scorched part of the leaf and the green part of the leaf. So you can see there's like this yellowish halo. Um, it doesn't always appear, but if, if you do see something that looks like that around August, um, I would say somewhere in like the beginning to middle of August, the scorching will kind of take place. So your tree might look fine um, earlier in the summer. And then as August comes around, it might start to have the scorched appearance. And then you start, you've been noticing that each year it's kind of getting worse and worse. It's most likely bacterial leaf scorch. Um, you can test for bacterial leaf scorch, but there is no uh, real treatment, I guess, um, or cure, I should say. There is a treatment, it's, it's actually an antibiotic because this is a bacteria, you can actually inject the tree with an antibiotic, uh, but that only treats the symptoms and the tree can become reinfected because the bacteria is spread by insects, um, like spittle bugs and plant hoppers that actually pick up the bacteria from um, plants that carry, that have the bacteria, but are not susceptible to it. So it is kind of a long-term treatment. You'd have to treat through your tree every year um, because it wouldn't cure it or protect it uh, for the long run. Um, and I just wanna note that BLS can also be spread by pruning tools. So if you prune a tree that has BLS and then you prune a tree that doesn't have BLS, there is a chance you could move the bacteria from one tree to another. So it's really important to sanitize your tools when you're going from one tree to another, not just for BLS, but really for anything else that the tree might have. Um, later, I'm gonna talk about uh, oak wilt, which looks very similar to bacterial leaf scorch. Um, so just be aware that there's two things that look really similar, but are very different. <laughs> um, exotic earthworms are not really an insect or disease, and they kind of have a different effect on forests um, than the insects and diseases that I mentioned earlier. Um, I think people have told me and I've heard that all the earthworms that are in New Jersey or probably in North America are not native. And, and so, you know, like, why is this one different? Um, so really the amianthus species is one of the worm species of concern. Uh, Metifier is another one, but um, I think the amianthus is the, is the one that's a, of a little more concern. Um, and the reason these are of a concern is because they are surface feeders. So unlike some other worms, like, uh, I don't even know worms that well, but 
like when I was growing up, they said worms were good for aeration because they go into the soil and they, they're deep and they feed down, you know, deep in the soil. Well, these worms don't do that. They don't go deep in the soil. They stay right on the surface. Um, they might poke down if it's cold or if they're trying to hide. Um, but otherwise, they're feeding on that duff layer and they uh, can consume a lot of duff and they can reproduce really quickly. And so it really affects um, the soil structure and the you know, the understory, I guess. And I have a, the next slide has a picture, uh, but I just, but um, there's no known management options for the worms. So really the, the word of advice is preventing the movement into new areas. So, you know, um, like just making sure you, if you have worms, you're not moving soil or sharing plants with soil attached to it, um, or just being aware of, uh, you know, really the, if, if the soil that you're moving might have worm eggs or even adult worms in it, because that's, that's kind of how they've, I think, been moving. So, so here are some pictures um, that I took from a website, basically, I, and I don't know if these are the same patch of woods or not, but essentially in a, in a forest that has no exotic earthworms, you'll see this understory has vegetation, but in areas where there are no earthworms or where they are earthworms, excuse me, um, it has much less vegetation. And I will have to say that this is definitely exacerbated by deer. So if you have deer and earthworms, that understory vegetation is gonna have a really tough time establishing. So what really happens is, you know, this is the same picture from the previous slide, but basically the earthworm is eating that duff layer. So there is no more, um, no more soil really. And all these, see how that soil is kind of granular. Um, they call that coffee grind or ground beef texture. It's essentially like these little tiny balls. It's the castings of the worm, like basically their poop. Um, and that's what is on the surface of the soil. So it no longer has this soil structure that where seeds can germinate, like establish a root because it's all loose and granular. So plants just can't like establish. And, um, and every time it rains, you know, if there's any kind of slope or anything that, uh, that those castings will wash away. So it's also encouraging like erosion um, or co even compaction. So, so that's what it's, it's really affecting. Plants that are already established probably are not really affected by worms because they already have their root systems established. But it's when you start thinking about, well, what's gonna come up next or what's in the understory vegetation, um, worms are surely gonna affect that, that uh, structure. So oak wilt, now I'm going into the section of things that are not yet found in New Jersey. Oak wilt is one of them that is not found in New Jersey, um, but it is found very close. So New York, the southern part of New York, like Long Island and Brooklyn, I believe are the two closest, but it is also found in like Pennsylvania and some other Midwestern states. Um, this is the, this is the uh, disease that looks similar to to BLS, to bacterial leaf scorch. So you can see it has that similar scorching appearance, um, the green portion of the leaf on the bottom. Um, sometimes it does have that halo, sometimes it doesn't. But the thing that's critical, critically different between oak wilt and bacterial leaf scorch is that um, oak wilt will kill a tree in a matter of weeks or at least in the same season of infection. So oak wilt is basically a fungus and it is spread two ways, either by um, insects, specifically natulid beetles or picnic beetles. And they are attracted to the fungal mat that the fungus forms on the tree and they feed on that. And then they carry the spores onto the next oak tree. Okay, so that's how it's spread by beetles. But it's also spread by root grafts. So you can see here, if there's oak trees growing next to each other and their roots are growing into each other, that fungus has the ability to live in the soil and kind of move between between tree roots. So, um, in oak wilt, the literature says the scorching appears in July, which is different than BLS, which occurs in August. But in places like Long Island and that southern part of New York, they still find oak wilt symptomatic trees up through like September. So um, really it's, uh, you know, it's really testing and also like how long the tree um, survives after the scorching appears. So like I said, with oak wilt, that tree is gonna be dead within the season, but in bacterial leaf scorch, your tree is gonna come back. Um, 
oak wilt fortunately can be eradicated and there have been places in like New York that that they were able to catch it early enough and were able to remove the infected trees, kind of create a buffer, remove a couple other trees as a buffer, excuse me, and they were able to um, prevent it from spreading further. So if it's caught early enough, it can be eradicated from an area, um, but it can be sometimes difficult to, uh, to detect. Laurel wilt disease is another um, fungus that has not been found in New Jersey. Um, it is a major problem in the southern states in red bay trees. So you can see here, uh, this is a red bay tree, which we don't have red bay trees in New Jersey, but laurel wilt disease can, inf can affect um, any tree or plant in the Lauraceae family. So in New Jersey, those are sassafras and spicebush. Um, I haven't heard of any, any um, spicebush infestations, but there are sassafras infestations um, in some of the states. And so, um, you know, my concern was to try to see if, uh, if this was present in any of our sassafras trees. The most concerning thing to me about Laura wilt disease when I first heard about it was uh, someone actually put like in their talk that they said the fungus that causes Laura wilt disease is very aggressive and mortality is thought to occur in trees attacked by a single female beetle. So it only takes one female beetle that has enough spores on her to cause the mortality of a, of a tree, uh, probably a red bay tree is what they were referring to. And so it's a very aggressive fungus um, and uh, carried by the red bay ambrosia beetle. And you can see uh, ambrosia beetles, not just the red bay ambrosia beetle, but all ambrosia beetles or most ambrosia beetles um, have this like toothpick effect. So you can see on this trunk of this tree, it has like these little frass tubes. It's basically as it's eating the wood and, and uh, excreting, um, it pushes it out in this like toothpick form. So laurel wilt disease is another thing that um, I do monitor for. I hang traps in sassafras trees. Um, I started that trapping uh, last year and we did not catch any red bay ambrosia beetles, but um, we'll continue to monitor for it in New Jersey. Um, oh, that's that's what I basically said was we did a trapping program. I forgot. Um, I basically had uh, three trap locations in Hunterdon, Ocean, and Burlington counties, um, and it's basically you just hang two traps at each site, and uh, you know all our collections were submitted to the U.S. Forest Service, and it came back with with uh, no beetles. But you can see, I mean, it's not really close to New Jersey, but it does kind of it is kind of spreading. And again, I feel like every year there's a new state county that has lower wilt disease. So it is moving and you know that always concerns me when things don't kind of um, stay centralized to where they start. Winter moth is another insect that is not found in New Jersey at this time, um, but it is of a concern uh, because uh, it's not native and it has kind of a, a little bit of a wider host range feeding on oaks and maples. Um, these are kind of unique, I mean, because the adults are active in the winter and that's kind of where it gets its name from. Um, so if you see like moths, this is the adult moth. If you, this is the male adult moth. So if you see like adult moths um, flying around in the winter, like, I don't know, December, November, December, uh, you know, it might be something to think about. The tricky thing is there is a native, <laughs> a native insect that kind of has similar uh, life cycles um, and so it might not be winter moth and then the other complicated thing is the native moth also hybridizes with winter moths so then there's hybrids <laughs> of the native and this non-native um, but this is the female she has no wings because she also doesn't fly um, but they basically uh, lay their eggs um, around the bud of the tree and then the the eggs hatch into larva kind of at the same time when the leaves are starting to open from the buds and then the caterpillars, they eat the leaves. So uh, it's, a, it's a very significant, you know, significant defoliator. Um, like I said, we don't have it yet, uh, but you know, there have been detections in Staten Island, Long Island and Rockland County, which is not terribly far from us. So it is something to keep an eye out for. Um, thousand cankers disease is another insect that we don't have in New Jersey, but 
Uh, you can see on this map here how close it is to us. So Pennsylvania has had uh, some positive detections of thousand cankers disease, which um, which is actually a, a complex between a beetle and a fungus. So basically the walnut twig beetle carries the fungus. Um, and as the beetle goes from tree to tree, um, it, it spreads the fungus and infects the other trees. The main host is black walnut. And, uh, and this picture is kind of unique because it's from the West, the Western part of the country. And I didn't realize this, but they plant black walnuts as a street tree. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And so what happened was um, in the West, they have Western walnuts that have this Pityopterus fungus um, and uh, the, I'm sorry, the Geosmithia fungus and the Pityopterus beetle, the walnut twig beetle. But the Western walnuts are, are not affected by this, by this fungus. But when they started planting the black, the Eastern black walnuts in the West, they started getting infected with this disease. They were susceptible to it. Um, so this pathogen is really native to North America, just to the Western, Western states. And eventually what happened was it, it started to um, move eastward. And so, um, and so that's how it's kind of been, you know, found in, uh, I think it's also found in uh, Maryland. Um, but uh, you know, I've been trapping for the uh, the walnut twig beetle and haven't found haven't trapped any successfully. And I also don't see black walnuts that are kind of under the stress. You know, so they say like the black walnut will have this um, water sprouting or epicormic branches along the trunk and kind of like these dead branches. Um, so I've been looking and I haven't noticed noticed that damage either. Uh, so hopefully, um, you know, I'll just continue to monitor monitor uh, that for that kind of activity. Uh, the reason it's called thousand cankers disease is because here you see in this picture, this is, a, this is one canker. It's generally no larger than a quarter. So essentially it takes a thousand cankers to kill the tree. So, um, so it can take some time before a tree does succumb to thousand cankers disease. But uh, you can see here like all the uh, exit holes created by the walnut twig beetle. So they can be uh, pretty aggressive when they're established. Uh, so that's all I have. I, I think I took a little longer than um, I had planned, but I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Um, and of course, if you think of questions later or you want to reach out to me at a later time, um, here's my contact information. And, you know, I'd be happy to talk to, to talk to anybody if they have any other questions. Well, thank you, Rosa. That was awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to stop sharing now so we can see the or is that good yeah sure okay